Thank you, John. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. It's good to have you here on this Harvest Home Sunday. Thank you so much for all of the donations of non-perishables that are going to go to the food pantry. This is one of those wonderful ways that we give without knowing who will receive, and that's a blessing too. And for those who heard about with the World Hunger Sunday, thank you for your donations there as well. And uh, we do have a few announcements I want to draw your attention to in the bulletin. First is that we have an Advent study that's going to be done online via Zoom Thursday evenings from 7 to 8. And we're going to start that on November the 30th. The book is really good whether or not you do the study. So the book is called All the Good, A Wesleyan Way of Christmas. And it really talks a lot about Wesley's means of grace, talking about good works, caring for others. And it's a really nice uh, book in the way that they tied it all together with the season of waiting in Advent. So that is something that you need to register for online so I can send you those links. So that you have the Zoom link and a reminder each time we're going to have the study. Also tonight we have the Penns Valley Community Thanksgiving service, which involves many of the pastors here in the valley, myself included. And we're going to begin worship at 6 p.m. If you'd like to sing in the volunteer choir, we're singing Here I Am for Worship. I do have music. If you need me to bring a copy with you uh, or with, for you, I will bring it. But we're going to begin rehearsing at 5 30. So if you'd like to sing, just come a little early. There'll be fellowship and refreshments uh, after the service. Coming up on Thursday, or not Thursday, Saturday rather, we will be decking the halls for Christmas here starting at 9 a.m. So please come. Many hands make light the work, and we're going to make it nice and festive. Next Sunday is Christ the King Sunday. We're going to have the Advent devotional booklets here. So uh, it starts on December the 1st, which is why we're bringing them a few days ahead. So make sure that you pick up your devotional next week. And then we have the first Sunday of Advent on December the 3rd, and we'll have a very nice wooden nativity ornament for each household to take with you. But take note, we have the Christmas party coming up December the 2nd from 2 to 4. We're going to decorate Christmas cookies and have all kinds of fun. And this is a party for all ages. This is not a children's party. This is a church Christmas party. So this is for all of us to gather just for fun. Um, are there any other joy, yeah, not joy, but concern, announcements to share this morning? I see a clipboard. Yes. Um, Pastor Steve, uh, our sister congregation at St. or at uh, Grace United Methodist in Center Hall lost a brother, and so I have a sympathy card here to send around that everybody can sign it, and then I'll put it in the mail to her. Thank you, Darren. Start it with Margie, and it can go around, and then I'll pick it up from Carson and Wonderful. Thank you. I, Sandy would very much appreciate that. That will lift her spirits tremendously. So thank you for signing that. Any others to share before we begin? I want to draw your attention to our centering words this morning. God blesses us with more than can be fathomed so that we can do good things in the name of Christ. With that, would you please rise in body or in spirit as you feel led as we prepare our hearts to worship by singing together the sanctuary song. Rejoicing for us. Our lives should be witnesses to God's goodness and power. Help us to be your workers and witnesses in today's world, O Lord. We continue with the 
opening prayer. Lord of bounty and blessing, we come to you this day in gratitude for all that we have been given. We are grateful for the blessings and for the opportunities to be of service to others in your holy name. Bless each of us here that we may become true blessings to others. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please open the United Methodist hymnal, turn to number 131. As we sing together, we gather together. We sow a bounty of love and grace for those who are in need of our gifts. And may each of us give as we will, not reluctantly, but rather, rather joyfully and with cheerful hearts and also with loving resolve. So let us prepare to bless those offerings by first singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings been overwhelmed by the indifference of the world, and have let it discourage us from the work of disciple-making and world-transforming to which you called us. Remind us once more of the victory of Christ and the victory available to us as we give our tithes and offerings today. May we do so with the confidence of victors, knowing that in your love, grace, and compassion you will have the last word. We pray this in the name of your Son, who bore our sins and who defeated our death. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. There are sometimes things that we hold in confidence that we can pray to God about, but in the silence of prayer, and that's because perhaps we're holding them in confidence for someone else, or we just simply feel like we're not authorized to share them out loud. So we go to God in silent prayer before we all pray together. For that very purpose, so let us pray. Great. 
Gracious God who clothes the fields, who feeds the birds of the air, on behalf of the church and the world, we offer our prayers. We pray to you more from our need to be transformed by our awareness of them than from any need of God to be reminded of them. Free us from all fear and worry that, trusting in your goodness, we may always praise your mighty deeds and give you thanks for the bounty of your gifts. We give you thanks for the fruits of the earth in their season and for the labors of those who harvest them. Make us, we pray, faithful stewards of your great bounty for the provision of our necessities and the relief of all who are in need as well. We lift the people and situations that weigh heavy on our hearts to you with gratitude for knowing you're already at work. You call us to be people of prayer, and so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And at this time, as we have been reconciled to God, let us reconcile with one another by passing the peace of Christ in any way that you enjoy. And now we're going to prepare our hearts for hearing the word read and the word proclaimed by remaining seated this time. But we're going to turn to number 102, and we're going to sing together now, Thank We All Our God. sang beautifully and on pitch, I might add. So it's a very special day. <laughs> we're going to go into our uh, readings today. We're going to begin with Psalm 123. And the message title is, Can I Be Grateful Despite Adversity? And so that explains why we're starting with Psalm 123. And I'm reading from the message paraphrase for this one because we read it often. I always ask that you read these passages in your own Bible later. We do have brand new paperback Bibles that we give away to anyone who needs one that they can understand. Uh, if you have one that's King James and you struggle with that one, uh, an NIV, we have those. Help yourself. But read them later to see how they speak to you then. So this is Psalm 123. I look to you, heaven-dwelling God, look up to you for help. Like servants alert to their master's commands, like a maiden attending her lady. We're watching and waiting, holding our breath, awaiting your word of mercy. Mercy, God, mercy. We've been kicked around long enough. Kicked in the teeth by complacent rich men. Kicked when we're down, 
by arrogant roots. In our final passage that we'll be reading here, I'm going to read another one in the message. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. But when you read this one later, I would encourage you to read the entire chapter of chapter 6. Because there's a lot that leads up to our reading today that's pretty important stuff. We'll talk about that later. But you'll see that in the New American Standard Bible, which is a word-for-word -word translation of the original language, uh, this particular passage is titled, The Cure for Anxiety. So there, if you've been looking, here we go. Jesus said, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is an interesting uh, question to end our series on. Of course, we've been talking about a passage from 1 Peter, and in it we are told to be ready to give an answer. When someone asks you a question, they find out that you go to church, they find out that you read your Bible, they find out you're a Christian, they can ask some really tough, tough questions. I'm not the only one that gets the questions. Sometimes other people do too, and so we need to be ready with an answer. And so the question today, the last one in our series, can I be grateful despite adversity? I would say that you... The, you really benefit from reading those passages prior because what Jesus is doing in those passages prior, because you heard in Matthew, the first part, it said, for this reason, I say to you, and it's really because Jesus is building up. He's, he's coming off of a, a section where he's telling the hearers, don't get hung up on your stuff. Don't get too concerned about accumulating stuff. Don't get connected too much to money because accumulation of stuff and serving God can be at cross purposes. And you cannot serve God in wealth, which is the actual verse before we started reading. So those introductory verses prior to the reading today, they challenge us about setting right priorities. Now the right priorities are not right priorities according to mom and dad. They're not right priorities according to grandma and grandpa. They're not right priorities according to Aunt Gladys or your Sunday school teacher, Uncle Edgar, your grandfather, the Presbyterian minister. Okay, the right priorities Jesus is talking to are right according to Jesus. Jesus labels right priorities right. And then he challenges us to take those right priorities as laid out by Jesus and then put our priorities alongside them so that we can measure, see, is there alignment here in these priorities or is there more of a stark contrast? Right priorities can be at the heart of why someone of meager means can be just as happy, content, and as joyful as anyone ever was, and why someone with seemingly everything anyone could ever hope for is absolutely miserable. Priorities impact our lives, they definitely impact our gratitude, they impact our attitude, and our priorities lead to our first response in time of trial. That's when we really do figure out what our priorities are. So is our first priority, is our first reaction, our first response to panic or to pray? 
And how many times did you hear, don't worry, in the passage from Jesus? I should have told you before so you could have counted. You can count later when you read it again. But there's a reason why don't worry is in there so many times. And it leads to the first point. Thanksgiving focuses our attention on God rather than our circumstances. When we focus on the blessings money can't buy, we tend to, when we talk about that with other people, find a lot more commonality about what we're grateful for. And Thanksgiving Day goes by so fast. It's one day, it's here, and it's gone. And although it comes to an end, our expression of gratitude to God for those blessings was never meant to be one day. And that's not the purpose of Thanksgiving Day anyway. Many places in Scripture we read that gratitude should be part of our daily lives, and there are many benefits to counting our blessings, even in times of adversity. And certainly the first one was in order to really give thanks for coming out of a very serious time of adversity. And so we're going to hear a little bit more about that from Psalm 92. It's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. In fact, I think far deeper than my own sometimes when I get a little too down and into my own stuff, right? But if I can look outside and I can see the beautiful blue sky and I can see all of the still a little bit of color hanging onto the leaves and I can see all of these things that I don't have a hand in. These were things God created. I didn't do that. But they're there for me to look at and say, yeah, that's right. My big problem is not the only thing. And so gratitude to God not only honors him, it is good for us. The next point is gratitude to God not only honors him, but it is good for us. And it's good for us because in the Old Testament, we see how God used this sacrificial system to teach his people how to be grateful and the benefits of being grateful. Because when God established the Hebrews as his nation, he gave them detailed, specific instruction concerning the laws and sacrifices so they would know how he wanted them to live. And his laws and sacrifices were intended so that through that practice, through that consistent practice, they would learn three important truths. Number one, God is holy. Number two, man is sinful. And number three, obedience is essential. We like to think of it as, you know, optional. And we find out in those times when we decide it's an option to not do things the way that the Creator says to do them, we can find, you know, it probably would have been better if I just would have done it the way God said I should do it. Jesus, though, was the final sacrifice, so we're no longer required to offer animal sacrifices. But the principles that the Lord taught through that sacrificial system are just as true and applicable today as they were then. And one of the offerings he prescribed was a sacrifice of thanksgiving that was performed every morning and evening, and it was spelled out in Leviticus 22. This twice-daily offering was intended to help remind the Hebrews that the Lord was the one that brought them out of Egypt and gave birth to them as a nation, not a cow that was made out of their jewelry that they handed over to someone after they came out of Egypt, right? So it was important for them to remember. Why is that? Well, if you were paying attention the last several weeks to the stories of the Hebrews coming out, out, out of Egypt, then you know that they were really good at forgetting and bad at remembering. Really good at forgetting and bad at remembering. Anyone? No. Yeah, so some things never changed. We're exactly the same. And so they needed to be reminded, and we need to be reminded, how God saved, kept, and provided for them, even though they were not always faithful. God truly was. So how can we follow that example taught by the daily sacrifice of thanksgiving? Well, we can begin by taking note of those simple blessings God provides for us. Sometimes they do not look like blessings. I have a friend, Wendy, who uh, had an incident this week. She lives in Phoenix, Arizona. It doesn't rain much in Phoenix, just so you're aware. 
Um, but she had had a whole thing with these wipers for her vehicle. She had to order them, and it took weeks for them to come in. And so she was grateful to have them because it happened to be raining one day this past week in Phoenix. And so she's driving down the road with her brand new windshield wipers going when um, a man at a bus stop threw a bottle at her windshield. And she heard it hit, and she saw the bottle go that way, but she saw something else go that way. And she just kept going because, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to you in Phoenix, and so anything can happen and usually does. She keeps going, and then she realizes, okay, the windshield is fine. Um, oh, but the passenger side wiper's gone. So apparently it took the brunt of the bottle hit, and it gave way, but the windshield was fine. So when you think about that as a blessing, you know, and it really was. She could have been replacing a windshield today, or even worse. She could, it could have been a very, very bad day. Um, really, giving God thanks for that is certainly honoring God, but it's good for her too, because it gives her a feeling and, and a sense of, of protection there. Because what are the chances in a moving vehicle? The bottle's going to hit right there. So also, having a grateful heart keeps our minds focused on the Lord. So the daily Thanksgiving sacrifice was this continual reminder for the Hebrews that their God provided for all their needs. And each morning is an opportunity for us to give God thanks for a good night's sleep. And if you tossed and turned all night, then you can thank God for a new day and another shot at a good night's sleep tonight. Because some of us do that, especially when you reach a certain age, right? It's a 50-50 it's shot whether or not you're going to sleep for all night, right? But all gratitude honors God, and we read that in Psalm 50, uh, verse 23. Those who bring thanksgiving as their sacrifice, honor me. To those who go the right way, I will show the salvation of God. So when we acknowledge the Lord is the source of our blessings, we're exalting him by declaring that our dependence is certainly on God for, for that kind of protection. I'm, how in the world am I going to know that I'm going to drive down the street and have to get my vehicle in just such a position to take that bottle with the windshield wiper? Fortunately, I don't have to worry about that, and neither did Wendy. So who hasn't breathed the prayer of thanks after narrowly escaping a car accident? I told the first church, I have at least once a month a car veering into my lane coming at me. I've never had this problem until cell phones were invented. But is anybody else experiencing that? It's at least once a month I got someone coming into my lane right at me. Until they, oh, get back in their lane. Fortunately, I've only had to honk my horn a couple times. But that appreciation helps us realize that we can't make it through life without God's help. And there's power in humility, understanding that I cannot do all things under my own power. Some people think that's weakness. No, it's not. It's truth and reality, and it's a relief. Thankfulness can be expressed in a variety of ways. Now, sometimes we express it here in worship, singing those hymns that we love to sing on Harvest Home Sunday. We can also express thankfulness during the time of our joys and sorrows. We can uh, express our thanksgiving in little everyday things. Whenever I have to fix something and I actually have what I need to fix it, that's great. Like I had something, I don't even remember what it was. I had to fix something and I went looking for it and I'm like, oh gee, I don't think I bought any of this glue or whatever for like two years. It expires next month. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness. I got to fix it and I didn't have to worry about it being expired. So yay. Next month, yes, but I didn't break it next month. I broke it this month, so not a bad thing. In these little things, we can find ourselves being grateful. I was grateful that someone noticed as I was leaving a meeting in a very big hurry and trucking it across the parking lot that I dropped a piece of paper that was extremely important. It was the whole punch list of everything I needed to do when I got back to my office. And the stranger picked it up and came after me and said, ma'am, you dropped this. And I was really grateful. And when you experience something like that, it makes you willing to do that for someone else. Because you know how valuable that thing that that person might have dropped might really mean something to them later, and, and returning it becomes important. But a spirit of thanksgiving is the result of remembering all God has done for us, because God's done a lot for us. The longer you live, the more that, that list grows and grows. 
And there are certain things that are God constants. They do not change. They will not change tomorrow. They cannot change despite what you've done, said, or you might choose to do tomorrow. These God constants can help invoke gratitude in our hearts no matter what's happening. So adversity doesn't challenge any of these constants. God chose us before the foundation of the world. We are indwelt and sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are eternally secure. We've been given gifts of the Spirit. We have an intimate relationship with the Lord when we choose it. We have the peace of God in our hearts when we remember that it's there. The Lord loves us unconditionally, and thank God for that. We're never distant from the presence of God. The Lord provides for all our needs. We have his divine protection each day. We have the promise of a bodily resurrection. We have the blessing of God's atonement through Christ and total forgiveness of our sins. We have an eternal home in heaven and the promise of resurrection. And finally, we've been given the word of God, the source of all knowledge and understanding. And so many constants in that word never change. Times change. Cultures change. Societal norms change. But people if you read your Bible carefully, you will see people do not change all that much. The habits that they had in those times when Jesus walked this earth, when Moses walked this earth, they're the same habits that we have today. The same temptations, all of it. So many constants that never change. So can we be thankful despite adversity? Well, Pay attention. Pay attention to the reasons to be thankful. Sometimes we're not always as thankful for something as we are when it's no longer with us. Sometimes we're not as thankful for that busy schedule until it's been completely halted for reasons we couldn't begin to have guessed would happen. The effect thankfulness has on our thoughts, attitudes, words, and actions can be very impactful. It can change how we view things and how we see things and how we talk about them. But it's also important to kind of pay attention to those times when something seems to want to keep you from thanking God in the middle of hardship or pain. That temptation to have some little thought in your head say, I can't be thankful till everything's perfect. But that's a lie. I can be absolutely thankful today, knowing full well, I am not perfect. How's that for an admission from your pastor from the pulpit? I am not perfect. <laughs> what can you do to increase your trust in God so that your first response is prayer than, for, rather than panic? Jesus has a way of calming the disciples' fears, and he does this understanding that when he calms their fears, he frees them for the work of ministry because anxiety can distract someone from the mission. In fact, anxiety has stopped mission cold dead. When people will say, I don't know what's going to happen I, until I know what's going to happen. I'm just not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait. What mission and ministry is done when we do that? None. Healthy gratitude empowers not only the person, but empowers the mission. That's what Jesus is trying to help us understand. So it's with gratitude that I give thanks to everyone who brought all of these wonderful donations uh, in for the, the uh, local food pantry. And I do want to close the message by offering a blessing over those gifts and those who are going to receive those gifts, because uh, it's going to be a wonderful blessing for them. So let us take an attitude of prayer. God of provision, through your word, you've told us that from our bounty, we are called to care for our brothers and sisters. So we ask that you bless these sources of nourishment, that those who receive them will be fed in body and fed in spirit. May they find comfort in these gifts. May they become curious about you. And we ask you also to bless the givers, that they may know how blessed they are to give. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. And with that, would you please rise in body or in spirit as we turn to our closing hymn, number 694, and sing together, Come, ye thankful people, come.
God, for all the blessings we enjoy, we give you thanks. Not just one day a year, but every day. We ask that you would help us look at the world around us in such a way that we see your hand in creation and in those we meet, even if they don't know it yet. Help us be a blessing today to those gathered around our table and in all our days to those we meet at home, at school, in church, and in our community. Go now and know that God was with you. Amen. Amen.